Okay. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to share our panel, Medical and Reproductive Tourism, Cross-Border Experiences and Implications. We have a very interesting panel of four speakers. I will introduce each speaker after I give a brief presentation and the background for this panel. So the panel, Medical and Reproductive Tourism, Cross-Border Experiences and Implications, uh, is going to be a very interesting panel as we are looking at the concepts called medical tourism, also known as cross-border medical travel, medical travel, medical exile, because the word tourism is contested and there are many others who have given different name and nomenclature. Medical tourism is also interchangeably used with health tourism. However, there is a difference between the two. If you look at across the world, there are patients who travel from one country to another and India offers world-class medical facilities comparable with any of the Western countries with state-of-art hospitals, best qualified doctors, best infrastructure, facilities, accompanied with the most competitive prices. And this is the reason why there's so much of inflow of patients to India. Ministry of Tourism and Culture as a part of Government of India, way back, a decade back, listed almost 160 hospitals. And there's been a lot of advertising of medical tourism across the world. And it's very interesting to see how it's written. Bright Sun, Blue Sea, Cosmetic Surgery, where the cost saved on one MRI could pay for a written ticket, medical tourism is bound to boom. Medical treatment in USA is equal to a tour to India plus medical treatment plus savings. Another interesting is medical tourism, sea, sun, sand, and surgery. However, another advertisement which calls as your health is our wealth, though not in a good taste, when you look at medical tourism, in India, there have been more than 5 lakh foreign patients traveling to India before COVID. Almost every year, lakhs of patients coming to major metropolitan cities and some other tier 2 cities also for various treatments. Further, globalization and progressively liberalized trade in health services in the ASEAN region has contributed to widening inequalities in health and healthcare. The flip side is that it has increased disparities between urban and rural areas and between rich and poor, resulting in polarization of healthcare provisioning. The health outcomes are in relation to social, economic, and geographical marginalization. Studies have also shown the undesirable consequences of rising costs, consumer exploitation, and increasing inequity in many areas. However, when this becomes an underlying principle, especially the markets taking priority, the long cherished ethos of India being a democratic welfare state where healthcare is the state responsibility and accessibility and availability of healthcare services is the right of the people often goes in the backdrop. Some scholars envisage that trade in health services can have a positive impact on the national health system in a variety of ways. And foreign investors can bring in additional resources, new technologies, new management techniques that can improve the provisioning of services and financing of system. These can improve working conditions and therefore reduce the health professionals to leave the country. And we have seen the reverse brain drain where many doctors who have been working abroad have come back to India to serve. However, it is also said that trade can be harnessed to benefit the whole health system only by strengthening of stewardship and regulatory functions of national governments. These are studies which have been done on various countries looking at the medical tourism and its impact. Studies have also shown that economic benefits from trade are concentrated in large businesses and individuals who are already wealthy. Commercial activity predominantly benefits individuals and corporate wealth at the expense of social objectives such as expanded primary care system. Health as a profitable trade 
industry, not just for the health professionals, a motley of other investors, businessmen, jewelers, hoteliers have all shared the pie of med medicine and also setting up hospitals. The most important factor to promote medical tourism is to showcase the cost differentials, which is around one-tenth in the developing nations to exorbitant prices in developed nations, offering a business and value proposition. Whereas the caption says, the first world treatment in third world rate shows clearly the cost differentials. India has been drawing patients from neighboring countries from uh, before, but then now, when you look at medical tourism, we don't uh, not not just have patients from Bangladesh, Nepal, Pakistan, Sri Lanka coming for tertiary teaching hospital like Ames and other public hospitals in major cities. We also have five star facilities and world class treatments, high tech medical facilities in the most uh, well developed private sector and corporate sector. So thereby, we have many more patients coming from not just the neighboring countries, but Middle East, African countries, and also Europe and UK, especially for the other, not just the biomedicine, but Ayurvedic treatments. And of late, a lot of Europeans and uh, Western world has been coming to India for Ayurvedic treatments and yoga and spiritual and healing processes. So with these words and a brief background, let us start this panel with a, a speaker. I would like to introduce Superba. Superba Sil is a doctoral student at Center of Social Medicine and Community Health, Jawaharlal Nehru University. Superba has worked in various research organizations on areas of reproductive health and rehabilitation. Her core research interests include reproductive health and the interaction between science, technology, society, and market in the domain of assisted reproductive technology. Today, she will be presenting Reproductive Tourism in India, a journey of technology, capital, and human resources. Over to you, Superba. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, let me just share the screen. Here is uh, Reproductive Tourism in India, a journey of technology, capital, and human resources. So the paper, uh, uh, you know, to introduce uh, the, you know, paper, um, I would like to talk about how assisted reproductive technology consists of a gamut of practices ranging from cryopreservation of eggs to removal of gametes for IVF and surrogacy procedures. The history of IVF can be traced back to the first successful human pregnancy through IVF in 1978 in Britain. And uh, in 1983, we have Alan Tromson's working group in Australia who managed to achieve the first pregnancy in a woman using donor oocytes and donor embryo. The birth of the first scientifically documented test tube baby Harsha ushered in a new era of assisted uh, conception in India in 1986. Since then, the ART industry in India has been uh, has seen a boom with introduction of uh, IVM in vitro maturation in 2003 while the first successful pregnancy through uh, frozen oocytes took place in 2019. So this is a little detail about when, you know, some of the practices um, sort of have been invented versus how when they have been introduced in India. So um, then, of course, to talk about, you know, uh, medical tourism and uh, transna transnational exchange for that matter. We, of course, need to talk about uh, the era when all of this became possible, which takes us to the years after globalization and liberalization, when India witnessed an exponential growth of ART clinics and hospitals, which offered a wide variety of services such as egg donor treatment, uh, donor embryo treatment, etc. Now, uh, all of these facilities, though they were uh, already available, uh, it was uh, facilitated by a relaxation of, um, you know, relaxation of policies during the liberalization, which allowed for, uh, you know, easy flow of technology from uh, Western countries to um, developing countries. The period from 2007 to 2009 have seen an increase in the number of artificially prepared cycles using hormones for frozen uh, thawed embryo transfers. And, and the numbers for the corresponding years have increased only from 1525 to 2678. The years after liberalization have therefore witnessed uh, the proliferation of ART industry in India as a manifestation of this transnational flow of technology across continents. 
the next segment of my paper discusses the transnational flow of technology in a little bit of more detail, wherein, um, you know, the transnational flow of technology um, is understood by the paper as, um, you know, being traced back to the policy of liberalization in the 1980s that permanently changed the character of Indian markets. Post the liberalization, India emerged as one of the major drivers of global economic and social change, and liberalization led to the dissolution of national boundaries that gave rise to global markets for labor manufacturing services, etc. Following from Bisht et al. 2012, liberalization therefore paved the way for foreign investors who were attracted by the large English-speaking workforce and the low cost. The healthcare sector in India therefore expanded significantly as a direct consequence of liberalization and by the turn of the 20th century, India had become a growing market for medical tourism, healthcare insurance, telemedicine, medical equipment, etc. Um, liberal, liberalization in the 1980s, which paved the way for private investors, also marked the beginning of an expanding private sector. Um, Following from Bisht again, this points to the role of International Finance Corp Corporation in promoting such an increasing role of private sector in Indian healthcare and such global partnerships that resonated with the new global India created a niche market for medical technologies, starting from stem cell to gamete donation and surrogacy. Reduction in import duties on high technology medical equipment further facilitated the growth of the ART industry through the proliferation of the private healthcare sector in India. The 1990s India was characterized by therefore collaborations between Indian companies and multinational corporations such as the Glenigals and Royalton Medical Management that facilitated the transnational flow of medical technologies. The next segment of my paper discusses how, liberal, obviously facilitated by liberalization, a market for ART was created in India. The market for ART, uh, however, was restricted to the private sector, leading to differential access of ART practices. And uh, in this context, Sarojini um, et al. 2011 discusses differential access as stratified reproduction, wherein healthcare became a site for corporate profit with regard to ART. Um, however, the paper does not go into the details of differential um, access to ART, but is primarily about the transnational flow, which we will discuss in a uh, little bit. Uh, the policies with regard to ART also support the expansion of the industry within the private sector, legalizing private public partnerships and medical tourism through the National Health Bill 2009. The ART industry, on account of being private, is characterized by a market rhetoric of demand and supply. And demand in this context for advanced ART techniques is often generated through attractive packages, schemes, concessions, etc., wherein advertisements play a significant role in raising the demand. And um, their, the websites of clinics often portray sections such as frequently asked questions about infertility, fertility myths, etc., uh, to make the package seem more attractive. One of the most significant market dimensions of ART is the notion of medical tourism that forms a bulk of its profits. The assisted reproductive um, policies in India since the years of liberalization have led to the proliferation of ART industry in India. Medical tourism covers export of healthcare services like specialized high quality treatment or diagnostic to the affluent and privileged patients who travel to the country of the service provider to or the service provider to use these services, which may either not be available in their home countries or if available, may not be of a particular level of standard. Uh, the exact terminology for medical tourism in the sector of ART is known as reproductive tourism, and the paper will attempt to understand reproductive tourism beyond um, the generalized terminology for the same. Reproductive uh, tourism, a concept note, is the next segment of my paper, which attempts to discuss how, you know, reproductive tourism uh, stereotypically refers to a situation where patients travel from one country to another in order to avail themselves of medical services in relation to fertility. Re reproductive tourism, therefore, is seen as a subcategory of medical tourism, since fertility patients travel often across national borders in order to receive a wide variety of assisted reproductive technology services including IVF, uh, gamete donation, intracytoplasmic sperm injection, sex selection, etc. Although not strictly tourism, the fertility centers around the world promote their services as IVF holidays or a holiday with purpose, offering clients a relax relaxing and calming environment while undergoing fertility treatment. Reproductive tourism a trans, uh, as a transfer of human capital and knowledge resources. This is um, the 
major segment of my paper which attempts to understand the notion of reproductive tourism in a much more holistic manner than simply the traveling of patients from um, from one country to another for fertility services. This paper therefore attempts to explore the concept of reproductive tourism, um, trying to understand it as any transnational exchange of human capital and knowledge resources between countries for the purpose of facilitating reproduction. In many ways, it is similar to Daisy Diomampo's understanding of transnational reproduction, but diverges from her understanding in exploring the transnational ex exchange of knowledge resources as a specific category. Borrowing from Gola 2013, this paper attempts to understand reproductive tourism as a form of trade, which includes the movement of capital from one country to another through the commercial establishment of the foreign commercial provider, which often takes place in the form of direct investment or joint venture between domestic and foreign partners. My understanding of reproductive tourism is inclusive of, but not limited to the movement of capital from a developed to a developing country. Following from Bharadwaj uh, 2018, the private sector of ART industry in India is gradually witnessing a string of transnational collaborations with ART clinics in the West, which in turn are looking at India as a new potential growth area for expanding clinical practice and research related to ART in the 21st century. Morpheus ART, a German Indian medical company, has set up centers in India and currently offers a second cycle at no extra procedural cost if the first cycle did not result in pregnancy, notes Bharadwaj watch following Pratap 2011. Large investments and plans to open up multiple IVF clinics in the Indian ART industry, um, such as the Bourne Hall Clinic, credited with creating the world's first IVF baby, Louis Brown, is an example in the same direction. The next portion of my paper will talk about the, how the uh, transnational flow of uh, you know, uh, tra how transnational exchange can also lead to the creation of a knowledge economy in the context of ART in India. As mentioned earlier, this paper attempts to understand reproductive tourism as transnational journey of technology, capital, and human resources. Transnational journey of human resources following from Bharadwaj is a result of stringent policy measures in the Western countries that act as a deterrent to further research and development of ART procedures. More and more doctors from developed countries are choosing to be part of the Indian ART industry on account of the less stringent regulations that allow greater freedom to the doctors. These doctors who have chosen to become a part of the Indian ART industry operate through international consultancy agencies consisting of healthcare consultants, such as organizations as MedGuru, Trivector Scientific International, etc., where they offer their expertise to clients who seek services of these consultancies as for issues related to infertility and assisted reproductive technology. This implies a transnational flow of knowledge from the West to Indian countries wherein ART specialists choose to be part of the Indian ART industry rather than the country of their origin. In conclusion, my paper attempts to envisage the involvement of Western ART practitioners in the Indian ART industry as a transnational flow of knowledge that can also be considered a, a part of reproductive tourism. The paper thus attempts to establish that reproductive tourism is not simply the journey of patients from one country to another for the purpose of fertility related concerns, but essentially implies a transnational flow of technology, capital, human resources and knowledge across continents. Thank you so much. I would like to now welcome Dr. Ratna Kumar uh, for his presentation. Dr. Ratna Kumar is a critical care physician he has completed his MBBS from Guntur Medical College, done his MD Emergency Medicine from SVIMS University, Tirupati, later completed his super speciality in critical care medicine in Andhra Pradesh. He, has he was trained in organ transplant, critical care, especially in liver and kidney, presently working as head of emergency and emergency ICU in emergency care unit, Asian Institute of Gastroenterology, Hyderabad, India. His core interest and work in organ, organ transplant, critical care medicine. Uh, today, he will be presenting on the topic, medical tourism and organ transplant in India. Over to you, Dr. Ratna Kumar. Coming to... Uh... The Indian interests and the Indian positives and negatives, actually, first of all, uh, uh, we will talk with that. And where we have to strengthen 
and uh, where we are in positive and where we are in negative, uh, we will just discuss about that in very briefly. Yeah. So coming to the strengths of the Indian system, uh, can can I slip the slides? Actually? Yeah. So the medical facilities in India are in the top line. Actually, uh, our Indian system has grown very widely and very fastly uh, in the recent few years. Everything uh, from transplants, like oh, we have started very slowly in, in the renal, then in the liver, uh, in the lung, heart, now in the pancreas, in the bowel also. Even the fecal transplantation is also going very actively in the medical fields. So the medical facilities in India are apt and they are growing very fast and they have already grown. We have kept our footsteps in the robotics and very minimal invasive and everything in a laparoscopic way also. So our physicians, uh, just uh, please skip. So our, our physicians in India, actually they are highly qualified. Many of them are uh, trained in well-reputed institutes not only in India and in the abroad also. So uh, because of this, they got a very good reputations. And because of this, actually they, uh, they carry a lot of, uh, what do you call positive thing, which, uh, which will uh, carry the patient overload to the Indian uh, scenarios things. And uh, next, uh, next please. So coming to the uh, positives in India, actually compared to the outside countries, or the competitors of India, we India, uh, the costs here of uh, whatever uh, they are, they want and whatever we are providing, it is very low compared. And also the appointments or uh, the waiting list for any organ transplant in outside India, like compared to US or Malaysia or anything, it is very, very low. And we can, we can easily get appointments in, in India, wherever we want. And there is a very, very less waiting period. And also, apart from that, many people these days are uh, growing more interested towards the yoga, Ayurveda, naturopathy, which uh, India acts like a hub, actually. So, uh, second. So, how, how the uh, people from outside can recognize what are the standards, which is uh, a, a good hospital to go or something like that. So, we have Two standardizations. One is the uh, Joint Commission International, so that is the JCA accreditation, and one is the NABH, that is National Accreditation Board. So these two, uh, they continuously every second yearly or fourth yearly, they visit the hospitals. They screen every inch to inch from emergency to the operation theaters, and they they help us to give the rating uh, to the hospitals, and they give a list to the government of India, and. My experience, actually, when when I entered into the critical care, when I inquired about how you people are getting information about these hospitals, that this is good or not, they told us that they inquire, they go into our websites and they search for the JCI accredited or NABH accredited. So the, uh, these ratings in our India, there are more than 100 hospitals for JCI and uh, countless numbers of NABH accredited hospitals in India. But what we are lacking, so actually for any organ transplant, there should be a donor. It can be a cadaveric donor, it can be a live donor. So cadaveric donor for the uh, patient's attendance, for them to counsel them to donate an organ is a big task. In a cultural, uh, linguistic country like India, it is a very, very uh, uh, a long process and because it is uh, because organ donation is not much into the people and there is uh, a, a lack of uh, awareness among the people and live donation live donation these days the number of compared to the cadaveric donation the live donation number is increasing but but because of uh, lack of awareness in the people they might think that they will lose something like that uh, for example for a liver if we take a 500 or a 600, 650 grams of a uh, organ, it will regrow itself. And if if we uh, go for a donation of one kidney, one kidney uh, can 
actually help in maintaining of the uh, functionality in the body. So lack of these awareness systems, we are lacking the donation load uh, compared to the acceptor load. Actually, it is way, way high. And in India, in a country like this, where now the transplants number is increasing very rapidly, but in India also, the donating personnel are very, very less. So we need to uh, uh, concentrate more uh, on this. Next, please. So where we are lacking? So uh, there, if if this is allowed in a very open way, then this can this can become a very Ill illegal and uh, it will it can become like an organ hub or a rocketing organ rocketing or something like that. So what we need is actually what we lack is we lack a strict nodal system where like a stepwise system, like whenever a patient is identified, like he is or he or she is having uh, some requirement of a transplant or something, there should be a stepwise model. Like they should meet some X, X department. Then they, they need to go to the accredited hospitals. Then they need to go with that, like that. That is lacking. And also in India, the, the local people also, they doesn't have any knowledge about the availability of the systems. Let me share you one single thing. Like when I was in my uh, MD, MD days, there are people, they used to think that whenever we have a liver jaundice or something, we will die. But that is just a starting problem where we can go up to the transplant also, which we needed uh, to uh, educate people in, in some places like Andhra Pradesh also. So we need a campaign from the government part. Next, please. So, and and where to go, actually. So people might roam here and there. They might not know what are the facilities. And this might, matlab, we might lose uh, the important window where the patient can be saved or his or her life can be saved. So they might be roaming in this or that hospital where they might not have any knowledge and uh, there might be very delay and the, the precious lives will be lost. So lack of awareness where these uh, hospitals or where these facilities are available uh, about the MVTF. So they need to be aware uh, by the government institutes. And one uh, and one more thing. Actually, in, in India, we are having a lot of JC accredited and a lot of, a lot, lot, a lot of NABH accredited hospitals. But if you see the pricing in hospitals, you can see a lot of barriers. Like uh, in a reputed hospitals, they might charge a different range. And in not so reputed hospitals, it's that. But the major thing is what I can surely say and what uh, we have seen in, in the corporate hospitals, which I have practiced is they charge almost 30 to 50% more in foreign uh, medical tourism patients, rather uh, these patients. So this is like a middleman system, which they have to pay. So these all should be addressed. Uh, so the uniform pricing should be there. And also, uh, it, they, many, of the, many of the people uh, outside, they might think that India is a populous country with lack of resources and everything, which is a misnomer. And they, uh, this, this misnomer is carrying uh, a decrease in the lot of patient load, which generally India is right now can face and can accommodate uh, at least 10% to 30% of uh, resources which we can we can uh, give to the patient load. So uh, how can we overcome this and how can we do this? So after COVID-19, after COVID-19, there was a lot of good propaganda in India where we received double the patient load about the uh, organ donation or organ uh, replay, uh, matlab, uh, system. And also uh, the connectivity have been improved. The airline travel system is improved. And also at least some part of uh, it is eased actually because the foreign patients, they might come, they might, matlab, they don't know where to go and when to whom to meet and everything. At least that is at least a little simplified 
but still a lot of work needs to be done. Now, what are the threats uh, we are facing? Actually, uh, in this field, if we have to improve on the connectivity, we have to uh, advertise ourselves, we have to educate people about the positivities and negativities, and we have to show India as a uh, leading place in the medical tourism. And also, we have a lot of resources. I, I, as I have worked for three years in Delhi, where we used to uh, go for a, at least two transplants a day at least. So that is a very good number. And people doesn't have any knowledge about this. So we can compete with good uh, uh, countries like Malaysia, Thailand and Singapore, which they are, they are doing even 10 to 20 times more compared to India. And also, still the hospitals in India, they need to be upgraded about their facilities, about their uh, whatever the medical uh, uh, so resources they are uh, being given to the patients. And also, not all the foreign patients are insurance covered. So what the field was and what is true is the money spent is also very, very high. So that is one of the uh, very constraints which we need to see about. And also, the major problem which India is facing is the middleman. So, as the patient, uh, whoever in India or in foreign, they doesn't know what is the destination and who is the primary physician. So, there will be a middleman and he will be costing, trust me, up to 30 to 40 percent, which is a very, very high load and which, which leads to a lot of uh, barriers like if he might go to a less resource hospital, he might, Madhav, he might land in another complications, which might uh, give a, a very bad reputation and which can decrease the things. So this should be addressed and this should be checked uh, by, by Indian uh, government. And also they have to liberalize the visa policy. They have to improve their air connectivity to others. And the government should keep a help desk, uh, at least, at least a, a log. Uh, so that they can address, uh, so that the people can uh, go into that because it is a very good income source uh, for a country like India. And also, converging all the wellnesses, hospitality, hospitality and traveling businesses and increasing the quality rather than the quantity so that it it, it is a self-propaganda what we are uh, offering the patients and it can uh, place people uh, it can place the indian medical system which we are offering in in a very very good place in the international uh, group when we compare it so most uh, what what i faced in my experience is the middleman system and lack of the uh, coverages uh, people are facing the lack of clarity so the government and we we people should concentrate more on the smoothest arrival, should uh, concentrate on the money linkages like uh, like uh, insurance coverage and everything, and middleman system should be eradicated. The government should take all the control. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Atma Kumar. We will move to next presentation. Um, So is my screen visible? Yes. Uh, let me introduce you. So should I start with my presentation? Wait, wait, wait. Just give me a second, ma'am. I'm just... Hello. Yeah, I think we need to uh, recording. Hello, everyone. I would like to introduce Dr. Sonali Kusum, Assistant Professor in Law, currently teaching in Tata Institute of Social Sciences, Mumbai. Sorry. She is an Assistant Professor of Law at Tata Institute of Social Sciences. 
She has submitted the PhD thesis on constructing a legal framework on surrogacy in India at National Law School of Indian University, Bangalore. She has received many uh, uh, awards and a PhD in law degree from Chief Justice of India, Sharad Arvind Bodbe, Supreme Court of India at National Law School, Bangalore. For her research contribution on surrogacy law in India, she had the opportunity to be invited by Rajya Sabha Committee on Health and Family Welfare to present her views and her suggestions have been included in the Rajya Sabha Report Number 102, August 2017 on Surrogacy Bill 2016. She is one of the members of International Surrogacy Forum. Previously, she had been Research Associate at Center for Child and Law as a part of UNICEF India project. She had been writing regular columns in the law magazine for All India Reporter Private Limited. She writes guest editorial in newspapers and quite a few online portals on medical, legal and public health issues and gender related legal and judicial developments. She has worked with women prisons in Maharashtra and conducted clinical field research studies on issues of bail legal aid, condition of maternal health, the plight of mother, women, inmates with children, and compiled reports and submitted to IG Prisons Maharashtra. She has worked with Maharashtra Legal Service Authority on similar issues and she delivered legal literacy sessions for women inmates. She has published her research papers on the same. Uh, Sonali would be presenting on the topic contemporary legal policy development on reproductive tourism surrogacy regulations act 2021 surrogacy rules 2022 over to you dr sonali hello thank you so much for having me on board thank you so much dr sunita for such wonderful introduction and saying kind words for me so without wasting much time i'll go on with my presentation so firstly, since my previous speakers have very well identified about the medical tourism, uh, so sorry, there is some technical issue with my audio. Is my screen visible? Yes. Hello. Please go ahead, Sonali. It's visible. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, okay. So fine. Uh, let me begin with my second slide. Uh, that is regarding the distinction between the medical tourism and the reproductive tourism. Some of my previous speakers have very well spoken about the idea of India being the hub of medical tourism. So basically, when we speak about India being a hub for reproductive uh, tourism, the main point is how do we distinguish between the two? Medical tourism, generally, we say when we are talking about a broad range of healthcare services, which can include organ transplant, which can include surgeries, which can include a lot of other healthcare access systems. But when we are talking about reproductive tourism of late, we are specifically talking about the issues as to how do we improve the procreative rights of the couples across the world? How do we facilitate right to family formation? How do we give them access to fertility care? That is the whole sole central idea of reproductive ter tourism in India. So when we are talking about reproductive tourism in India, it is very important to understand that there is a range of new technologies which has come up, of course, with IVF, in vitro fertilization, assisted reproductive technologies, encompassing surrogacy, and other means. And India has been a pioneer in the field of ART as well as surrogacy since the 1980s itself. So let me go into the phase where we were talking about, sorry, yes, the reproductive tourism and India being at the hub of it. Back in 2008-2009, India really served as a hub of reproductive tourism because we discovered or we practiced surrogacy at large scale at a very cost-effective price with the best medical infrastructure. 
this was also notified and very much publicized by various documentaries, by BBCs, by various news reports. Most importantly, two landmark judgments were spoken about in surrogacy in India, which is about the case of Baby Manaji versus Union of India, as well as Jan Balaz versus Union of India, 2009-2010. Besides that, it was also realized all over the world that how reproductive tourism is very, very significant. At the cross borders, if we see, many countries started developing their legislations and policies on surrogacy. One of such is the whole idea of uh, surrogacy being formulated at Vietnam under the Vietnam Surrogacy Law, Vietnam Marriage and Family Law 2000. One excellent example of looking at surrogacy and reproductive tourism is how they look at it from the law as facilitating right to procreation, right to privacy, right to family formation. Therefore, they call this particular surrogacy law in Vietnam as humanitarian law, something which facilitates the infertile couple as the whole and sole means or the only means to have children, which is biologically or genetically connected to them, at least by one of the partners. Similarly, there are a series of US case laws as well, where the same issue of surrogacy being a right, right to procreative choice, right to family formation, right to choice of a couple. You know, the whole concept of reproductive autonomy was very much signified and explained by the U.S. court cases back since 1980s itself and then on, including the last of its kind, the Roe versus Wade, which again got overruled. But the point being the idea that how surrogacy was seen as a reproductive autonomy, a choice of reproductive freedom for an adult couple or an adult individual also how and by which means, at what age, by what stage, by using what technology they would want to conceive and have uh, birth to the child. Especially for the infertile, this is the only or one of the only means by which they can have genetically related child. So at the global perspective also, the whole significance of reproductive tourism, the whole significance of surrogacy is looked at from a very right-based perspective. In law, it is very, very important because right to family formation is something which is a part of our right to life. Even our Indian constitution under Article 21 talks about this whole legal perspective of right to privacy, right to family formation. The recent judgment of S.K. Puttu Swami, you know, uh, which is also called uh, popularly the Aadhaar judgment 2012-13 of the Supreme Court. Then in the last 2017, Navte Singh Johar 2017 onwards, the whole concept of reproductive autonomy, privacy, personal liberty, these things have been, you know, signified. At the international convention also, these concepts have been very much signified. So we have to understand that surrogacy and reproductive terrorism, uh, tourism has to be seen from this light. Now we come to the landmark developments in India with respect to the reproductive tourism, which was witnessed in India. At 2008-2009, as I earlier mentioned, there were two landmark judgments, which was the case of one Japanese surrogate baby, baby Amanda Manaji, who was born in Anand in Gujarat at the hands of Dr. Naina Patel in her clinic in Anand in Gujarat. That particular court case went into a lot of controversies for the very fact that India did not have any act to regulate surrogacy. But the best part was India had the medical infrastructure, India had the medical technologies, as well as the resources to deliver a very cost-effective surrogacy as a reproductive tourism hub in India. Thereon, there has not been looking back for India, a lot of ART clinics, infertility clinics developed in India. The only legal glitch was, how do we address the issues of a child who's born to a foreigner in India and who is born of an Indian surrogate mother? There were legal issues with respect to birth certificates, citizenship and others, but the point being it only needed a law. Now, I go to another development of the Ministry of Home Affairs Foreign Division Guidelines 2012. This was another back then a very important thing which promoted reproductive tourism and surrogacy and ART things in India for the foreigners as well as because the point was that how do we bring in more reproductive tourism? At one point of time, Government of India also gave a lot of tax incentives to private hospitals as well as government hospitals for bringing in uh, foreign um, travelers or foreign um, patients who are seeking ART treatment. This was facilitated by this guidelines of the Ministry of Home Affairs 2012, wherein they provided for medical visa with S, marking very clearly that they are coming here for medical treatment and for surrogacy for infertility. 
the whole idea behind just marking s anonymously was because again uh, there is a right to privacy which protects the rights of the couple to not disclose their condition or the background of infertility so this medical visa s category was genuinely developed by the government of india ministry of home affairs division 2012 to facilitate reproductive tourism in india through surrogacy yes yeah then the other consequences were a lot of ethical social and legal issues cropped up first because of course in india there was no such act to regulate surrogacy in india the social and the ethical issues were mostly with respect to the fact that that since the foreigners are coming to india and we have the surrogate mothers in india very readily available because there is a section of society in india especially women as a class they have a section of society who are slightly disadvantaged because of their social educational economic profile they may not be in a condition to secure a well organized white collar jobs so to say an organized employment so there is a whole lot of unorganized labor market and there is a lot of women who are willing to be surrogate for the very fact that they are not able to get alternatively such kind of a you know engagements in the organized sector so there was a ready av availability of the surrogate mothers in india this ready availability of the surrogate mothers in india this particular phrase was also highlighted by the supreme court of india in baby amanda manaji versus union of india considering the fact that in india we have lot of women population within that age bracket which suits to be the surrogate at the same time they are not so literate they are probably school dropouts the literacy rate is low they are under a compelling economic pressure to get some kind of a source of money to support their livelihood to support their children sometimes so that kind of fits the bill and there was a ready availability of the surrogate mothers and this also led to the issue of the class caste race and other issues which was very much magnified and written uh, very adversely by the media saying that the indian women are becoming the uh, they are being rented as homes by the foreigners and the women are being exploited but having said that i would like to also say that most of it was very much a media narration and a media created a uh, uh, narrative because when we do not have an act we do not have a statistics or a data on how many women are becoming surrogates in a year in india or in any state for that matter we do not have a record or data keeping or any such kind of a mechanism because there is no act by then we did not have any act or law so during that time how can we say very categorically that the foreigners are coming and exploiting indian women because it is not the foreigners or na nationality of an individual which would exploit the surrogate mothers rather it is the technology if at all if it is not regulated if it is an excess of art or whatever that can be exploitative but the nationality ascribing and blaming only the foreigners to say that they are coming and they are exploiting the indian surrogate mothers that is also a misnomer so that because i personally as a part of my research i filed a lot of rtis with government authorities government hospitals when i clearly found that none of the hospitals had any clear record in and around 2013 or 14 or even from the whole period of 2010 to 2014 they had no record keeping on how many surrogate mothers are there in india how many surrogate mothers are there who are going through mmr maternal mortality or they are going through any kind of uh, health issue because they are being uh, functioning as surrogate or delivering the babies of the foreigners and how do we distinguish them if they are being surrogate for the indian couples so now this led to a lot of issues of exploitation and other issues of uh, you know ethical issues and social issues caste class issues which led to a lot of protest especially by the civil society groups and this led also the uh, filing of a major pil in the supreme court of india that is jashree ward versus union of india 2015 this was a breakthrough pil in the legislative developments towards surrogacy because before this the only landmark judgment was baby amanda manaji versus union of india 2008 and jan balas versus union of india 2009 and 10 in which the supreme court was leaning in the favor of legalizing surrogacy but in jashree ward versus union of india supreme court gave it away to the legislature to draft a law which will protect the women of india from any kind of exploitation because there was no law part of it was also to say that commercial surrogacy which was being practiced in india without any law was leading to exploitation it was leading to uh, a lot of uh, unfair incentive being created for poor indian women to act as surrogate which is leading to their health exploitation so, so therefore Nani, the supreme so court Nani, directed the legislature to enact a law which will prohibit commercial surrogacy and allow only altruistic surrogacy in india there so are five minutes please the legal regime of surrogacy in india completely changed 
which also affected consequently India being as a hub of reproduct, uh, reproductive tourism or India having some kind of restraints on being a hub of reproductive tourism. Thereafter, the major development which happened in India was uh, the drafting of the Surrogacy Act 2021. This has come out after a lot of consultation. There was a parliamentary standing committee report which was convened by Rajya Sabha. I also happened to be part of it and I represented my views. A lot of doctors, um, academicians were consulted. There was also law commission report in between, which also favored in India legalization of uh, altruistic surrogacy. Now, quickly moving on, I will just highlight some of the important features of this particular act, Surrogacy Regulations Act 2021. The most important thing is it allows in India only altruistic surrogacy. And it allows surrogacy only for Indians, mostly for Indians, because it addresses in the criteria, uh, the criteria which are saying that they have to be married, they have to be Indian, and they have to be also, of course, heterosexually married. And they have to also get surrogate mothers, either of their own family members or someone from the ART bank. So basically now what India permits is altruistic surrogacy, domestic surrogacy for Indian married couples. Okay. So now... Some of the important legal instruments by which surrogacy in India is regulated right now is the Surrogacy Regulations Act 2021. Then we have Surrogacy Regulation Rules 2022. Also along with it, a lot of statutory authorities are created like National State Assisted Reproductive Technology and Surrogacy Boards and Surrogacy Registry. And then we have also parallelly ART Act 2021. Now, Keeping in with the theme of our presentation, I will highlight some of the important factors right now in view of the recent development Surrogacy Regulations Act. What are the good aspects which boost reproductive tourism in India? Few points which most of us highlighted, uh, even the previous speakers highlighted, I will skip that part, availability of the medical expert, success in IVF rate, cost effectiveness. I'll go into the legal aspects rather. Of course, advancement of medical technology, I'll just... I like the other aspects which are mentioned in the Surrogacy Regulations Act. Most importantly, now availability of surrogate mothers is made easy. You can have a family member also to act as a surrogate mother. There can also be a willing woman. Any woman whose friend, family, relative or the surrogate mothers can also be procured from the ART banks. Other important aspect is the number of oocytes to be placed in the surrogate mother, which is provided in the Surrogacy Regulations as three oocytes to be provided. Gametes and gamete donors can be procured from the ART banks. Now it is the responsibility of the ART bank and the clinic to procure it. Now it is no more the burden or the onus of the couple to look at the gamete donors on their own. Again, now there is a very good system of providing um, child care leave for the intending mothers who are going to avail surrogacy. This is one progressive development. A lot of judgments have come up by the Supreme Court to allow child care leave, which is equivalent to maternity leave for the intending mother. Okay. Now, some of the other also aspects are now there is a very clear cut uh, performa which is provided and a standard performa provided for surrogacy agreement, also for the informed consent under surrogacy regulation rules, which has to be looked at and ensured compliance by the ART clinics and the infertility clinics. It is no more the burden to prove for the couple. Birth certificate of the child is also resolved because the birth certificate is to be issued by the magistrate under the Surrogacy Act and the couples have to apply for the same. It is very clearly stated that no more the genetic connection or any kind of uh, attachment between the surrogate or gamete donor and the child born of surrogacy is ruled out. It has to be very clearly legally documented that the child born of surrogacy has to be uh, the child of the particular concerned couple. Now, some of the catchment areas uh, where there is still scope for boosting this uh, surrogacy as a reproductive tourism place in India. Though the law says that it has to be Indian and all the other criteria, but nowhere it is very clearly prohibited that there cannot be any consultation, counseling or treatment which is being offered to foreigners. Another thing is that there is no clear restriction on the movement of the surrogate mothers. And there have been many studies where it has shown that the clinic or the doctors are moving across the borders to facilitate just the implantation in the surrogate mother. There is also scope that the surrogate mother can be moved because there is no indication in the Surrogacy Act or in the rules 
clearly specified that the surrogate mother has to live for the entire period of gestation in any particular concerned place. So this can be used as a loop where she can move to some other area or she can be moved with the intending parent. Another very important point is that the Act, Surrogacy Act and Surrogacy Rules allow that an ever married woman or a single individual also can be a parent through surrogacy, especially it is in the interest of the women because it is clearly provided that a woman can also opt for surrogacy. A single uh, unmarried, widowed, ever married women are also allowed. So a single parent surrogacy scope is also not ruled out. Another very, very important factor is if a foreigner wants to still have a baby in of surrogacy in India, one of the legal solution is to appoint a legal guardian in India under Guardian and Ward Act in India, at the same time become their co-parent. So still everything is not ruled out. There are legal scopes and possibilities where it can be facilitated. Now quickly moving to some of the challenges. One of the major challenges which is there is that surrogacy agreement, though the pro forma is provided in the Surrogacy Act, one of the major problem is how do we enforce the bindingness of a surrogacy agreement or for that matter birth certificate of child outside India. There is one provision by which we can facilitate that is the use of apostille seal which can be applied through Ministry of Home Affairs under apostille convention. Another ch challenge is that right of a surrogate mother to seek abortion. This has gone many times in cases with the infertility clinics out of my research where surrogate mothers want to withdraw their consent during the period of surrogacy. So this is one issue because now it is very much guaranteed under the act that they the surrogate mothers are given the right save under the medical termination of pregnancy act to abort or to seek abortion as per the MTP act. Major challenge again remains with respect to child born of surrogacy as there is no breastfeeding provided. This has been another major, major concern which has not been addressed over a period of drafts of the surrogacy bill uh, since 2008, we can say, or even in the ART Act, nothing is mentioned. Surrogacy rules do not mention about when the child is born of surrogacy, who provides the breastfeeding. There is no human milk bank provision also which is provided. So this is another major challenge. Okay. And another thing is there is no scope anymore for the couple to have any kind of outsourcing of the gamut on their own because now it is very clearly stated in the act it has to be done through the ART bank. Another major hurdle which remains for the couples is a series of consent and approval has to be obtained from the medical authorities which are under the Surrogacy Act. They have to get a certificate of medical uh, necessity from the uh, hospital then they have to get some approval from the surrogacy board. The major problem remains if the approval is not given by the statutory authority and the women as well as the man has a certain age limit or certain kind of restriction with respect to, you know, uh, by when they want to have the child. So there is no time and there is no time maximum or minimum period provided by when this approval may be given to the couple. Another major issue is if the approval is not given by these authorities, where do the couples go? if their approval which they have sought for surrogacy for the procedural consent, if it is not given, should they approach the court that is not provided? Yes. Now, so age limitation is another factor which I would like to highlight through one of the case laws. Yes. Now, one of the major contention is the age limit for the intending couples. The minimum and maximum is provided is 23 to 55 is the broad category for the couples, intending couples to seek surrogacy. But there has been a lot of judge, uh, cases which have been filed in Kerala High Court of late in 2023 and 2022. I will highlight one such cases, Sanjeev K versus Union of India 2023, where it talks about that the age has to be extended. Okay, just one last point and then I will wrap it up. Okay, another major issue or a major problem right now is also with respect to the constitution of district board and all these statutory authorities which have been created like the national and the state surrogacy boards. All these authorities are good on the paper but most of them have not been constituted because of the staff and other issues. So what it led to is that many of these couples they were not able to get these permission within the time. Therefore the court had to allow them to still go on with the procedure. So with this I would like to also just conclude Having said that, I would just highlight one or two important points. Still, India remains as a hub of reproductive tourism. There are challenges and there are legal means to circumvent it. Uh, there is a lot more developments which are going to come because a lot of these provisions are already being challenged before the court of law, including the age criteria of the intending couples and other procedural compliances. So we have to look forward 
what the law brings for us in future. Thank you so much. Thanks for your patient listening. Thank you. Thank you, Sonali. Thank you so much. You sir first. Let me introduce Madhushri. Madhushri has been working as a postdoctoral research associate in the European Research Council funded project Laws of Social Reproduction based at the Dixon Poon School of Law, KCL. At present, she is located at IWWAGE, that is Initiative for What Works to Advance Women and Girls in the Economy, an initiative of IFMR LEAD. She has completed her MPhil and PhD in Regional Development from Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. Her core research interests include gender and work, women's reproductive autonomy, and socio-economic intersectionalities. Madhushri will be presenting on Prohibitionist State and Women's Reproductive Labor, a case study on India's assisted reproductive technologies sector. Over to you, Madhushri. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, so uh, I'll just, this, my presentation will focus on the impact of the law on the reproductive labor, how the law impacts the labor. Uh, so uh, I'll just start. So I'll skip the, because my previous presenters have explained extensively, you know, about the reproductive industry and the reproductive tourism aspect of it. So I'll just briefly uh, like start that in 2001, after uh, the, like the surrogacy was legalized in India, India has emerged as one of the largest reproductive industries across the world, catering to childless couples, you know, coming from all, all, over, the, like all, all over the globe, with uh, women, especially from the you know, underprivileged socioeconomic classes, working as surrogates and egg, donation, egg donors, which uh, have been you know, extensively studied by the scholars studying reproductive labor and reproductive rights. So uh, be, this basically was a result of the medicalization of reproductive processes, which happened over the years. And under the Indo Indian scenario, one of the most lucrating fact lucrative factor was the hope of a biological child, you know, the promise that the ART sector makes to give one childless couple to their biological child, which worked as a huge incentive for the couples to offer the IVF processes. So uh, basically, uh, here I would like to employ, like, talk about one concept which was coined by Maria in Horn. In 2003, she talked about this concept of repro space, which is the transnational trajectory within, capi within which capital bodies and bodily substances, such as the embryos and gametes are relocated under legal regulations and social religious practices. So this was exactly the case in India, which gained popularity as a reproductive tourism hub due to the factors that, again, my previous presenters explained very beautifully. So, but at the same time, these uh, biomedical advances in you know, the IVF sector led to a substitution of the maternal role. So it provided women who could not bear a child naturally with the opportunity to become a mother without being able to carry the child in her womb. And at the same time, it altered women's fertility experiences. But along with that came the ethical dilemma of, you know, which was which is associated with the third party reproduction, which is basically, uh, you know, explained in the stratified reproduction theory, because the different because the differential power dynamics that is associated with the different stakeholder, because women who visually work as uh, surrogates or egg donors are they belong to a different social economic background compared to the women who avail those services so that the the power dynamics the like the scholars argue that it might lead to some exploitative potential of the practices in the art industry but at the same time it's very uh, important to recognize that the even though the women who came worked as surrogates or egg donors and came from a very underprivileged economic background, 
just because they belong to this certain social cultural strata does not make them as mere victims of you know the capitalist production processes and therefore it should be important to remember to understand the multifaceted multifacetedness of the reproductive labor that it constitutes so basically regarding surrogacy there has been surrogacy and egg donation there has been two you know like schools of thoughts so it, one is the exploitation argument so uh, like the proponents of this um, school of thought they argues that in this process the un, the well being of the women the who, women who's carrying their child as a surrogate or who's donating her oocytes their well beings are being undermined by the production processes and because they come from a very uh you know like they don't have much educational attainment and they do it out of a fine like dire financial desperation so their bargaining power is also less and in the process it ultimately common like it it leads to the commodification of their bodies so all the at the same time the structural inequalities in the labor market that is the different power dynamics between the different stakeholders like the doctors the um, you know stake uh, the intermediaries and the surrogates and the egg donors are reflected in the employment contracts and working conditions which is citing mainly the you know the uh, surrogacy hostels where the surrogates were being kept uh, and uh, the aspects of restricting mobility they were not allowed to leave the surrogacy homes or they were uh, suppose like they were not allowed to stay with their family in certain cases it also uh, has been widely critiqued and uh, the, this uh, school of thought suggests that their autonomy and decision decision making capacity is also limited and at this on the other hand there has been a rights debate so mostly, mostly the marxist feminist theorist they talk about because with the like the uh, so the critique of the social reproduction theory they talk about how the boundaries between the public and private the market and non market and the production and reproduction has been has been obliterated over the years and uh, like being able to give birth the process of giving birth which was initially considered as a very intimate experience which was supposed to take place within the four walls of a private space is now slowly becoming incorporated into the domain of you know capitalist uh, production processes so therefore surrogacy and egg donation should be considered as a form of re reproductive labor and denying women to uh, you know get a compensation in exchange for the labor that they perform is actually denying women the right to work and uh, they also called out the state for uh, controlling women's bodies and making decision on their behalf so uh, in her exploration on commercial surrogacy in india rudrabha talks about um, uh, the phrase markets in life where she talks about the ways in which the reproductive markets are assembled by people from different margins of the society as well like as with people from you know like the social the uh, deprived socio economic background as well as individuals from more privileged sections of the society and uh, rudrappa pandey and other you know like uh, some of the seminal works in indian context of surrogacy they said that reproductive work is in in fact a very intimate and embodied form of labor because the end product which is the baby here is not something that you can just buy sell buy use and discard but it has more complicated and you know and long term emotional repercussions uh, so uh, i would not go in the like, talk uh, very in very detail about the you know the uh, the legal landscape of, of the surrogacy and art sector in india so basically uh, after the surrogacy like after yeah, the yeah the surrogacy was legalized in india in 2001 the indian council of medical research came up with different guidelines in 2005 2008 2010 2017 and 2020 to uh, you know regulate different aspect of the industry but basically if we see the transformation of the legal landscape of uh, you know indian surrogacy and art sector we can see that the indian state approach has veered from a medico liberal 
contract based model in the 1990s to a familial model so this which basically banned uh, the lgbtq communities the same sex couples from availing surrogacy in india in 2012 and then uh, a consequent ban on foreigners from availing surrogacy in india so these proposed ban so this progressive ban on uh, ban on surrogacy for various groups culminated to a complete ban on surrogacy uh, especially the compensated surrogacy in 2020 and uh, in 2021 december the parliament passed the surrogacy regulation act and the assisted reproductive technologies regulation act so the uh, focus of this paper is to understand what the repercussions of the law would be on the reproductive laborers of this sector which are mainly the women who works as surrogates and egg donors so the question that we need to ask here is would abolishing compensated surrogacy and egg donation stop the exploitation of largely poor and socially disadvantaged women in the south would they continue to participate in the sector for the complex and multiple reasons that underpin their choices and would uh, abolition impact on the structure of the sector and what would it mean for the women so uh, basically uh, this study has been uh, like I've, this study has been started in 2016 and 2017 so i did a empirical like uh, field survey in the northern uh, india especially in delhi to understand how uh, to understand women's lived experiences and surrogates and egg donors and to understand the complexity of reproductive labor so as uh, you know uh, like extensively studied in the indian scholarship on surrogacy and the reproductive rights scholars so the women who mostly engage in the sector are migrant women who come from nearby rural areas or other states and in some cases uh, neighboring countries such as nepal but the commonality between these women is they have you know associated disadvantages for poverty lack of networks of support and access to em employment and low educational attainment and in case of the workplace dynamics the environment environment in which women work women's limited understanding of the contracts was one of the very uh, you know uh, interest fascinating factor to observe because the women who came from very low they had very low educational status so they didn't understand what was exactly written on the contracts or the contracts were not explained to them in the language that they understood so they did not understand they understand the legal enforceability of the contract and they did not know what to do in case their contract is breached and at the same time the in term the role of the intermediaries they have immense control over the women who were engaged in the reproductive sector so basically uh, they the uh, you know the communication between the donors or the surrogates and the uh, commissioning couple would be controlled by those intermediaries who would all all who would also take a part of the payments and because of these you know and they were not being properly counseled so they were not uh, like you know explained the risks or side effects of their contract so that made difficult of the possibility of the women of giving an informed accent so if you look at these uh, narratives it says how, it explains how women who you know had very limited understanding of the medical procedures that they undergo but they understood very little what was written in the contracts and they understood very less about the repercussions of the procedures that they undergo and they also had very limited bargaining power so even if because india was having a very large pool of women who were willing to work as surrogates or egg donors for a very you know cheaper uh, rates even if women did not agree, like you know agree with the amount they were being offered they were just you know had to go with it because they didn't have any other options available to them and but on the other hand it would also uh, you know be imp important to notice because these women came came from very you know low so lower socio economic backgrounds and in most cases they they would be you know the only earning member in the families because they would either be abandoned their husband would have left them or they would be widows or uh, you know a uh, Uh, divorces so they would not have any other means of income and surrogacy or egg donation would provide them with the opportunity to earn some money for the betterment of their lives and it would also give the give them a sense of emancipation within the families it would help them earn some respect from their relatives even if you know they could not oh, talk 
openly about it. So if you look at this, you know, some of the narratives that have shown here. So this surrogate Preeti, she said that when I go back now, I can get my son into a good school. I can give him a good future. More importantly, I, he, I would now be loved and respected by my son-in-laws. So this also, you know, granted them as a sense of emancipation by, you know, elevating this, their life situations. And so uh, now I would like briefly discuss what impact the law would have on the AIT sector. So the law basically tightens the regulation of on AIT sector. It's very particular about who can and cannot access the ART services. So mostly it's the heterosexual married couples. And there's also a capping on age as my previous presenter uh, mentioned. So, uh, but at the same time, there's one discrepancy in the law, which in the both the laws, which said that uh, single women, any single women above age 21 can go for other IVF services, but they cannot go for surrogacy services unless, unless they were married, on, they were ma ever married, like they were widows or divorcees. So this uh, sort of reflects the state's, you know, mindset on the stigma that we still place on widowhood or you know women being divorcees so they have less opportunities available to them so they can offer surrogacy but not single women and at the same time this law has been critiqued for upholding the traditional patriarchal family values as is as it exclude you know the same-sex couples cohabiting couples single men and uh, some other group of population who are excluded from the purview of the law and also there's a presumption of force in the law the law uh, the language of the law is framed in such a way which, you know, uh, assumes that women are being forced to act as surrogates or donate their eggs. So it, uh, it this, uh, you know, this approach has been critiqued for, uh, like, you know, adopting a, a prohibitionist approach, a very reductionist approach in the law that women cannot be autonomous agents of their own lives and cannot control their own bodies. It's the there's a presumption that some you know they are forced by somebody either by the family members or you know they're exploited by the doctors so they are basically the victims so this reductionist approach needs to be challenged and lastly the implications of percent of person of Indian origin and the overseas citizens of India's so basically they are allowed to uh, offer surrogacy in India with prior approval from the na na the nat national board. But as my previous presenter mentioned, given the, you know, the paperwork, the bureaucratic processes that are being now in like being incorporated into the surrogacy and the egg, some of them in the egg donation sector, uh, like how likely couples living abroad would, you know, be willing to come to India and, you know, offer these treatments is remain like remains to be seen. And there's also some issues on implementation in the ground level. So uh, certain, you know, the dogs, uh, as a part of my uh, current project, we've interviewed a lot of doctors all across India. So the, the view is that this, uh, this law would mainly affect the smaller independent clinics and it uh, indirectly prefers the corporate chains and the bigger clinics who have enough resources and manpower and it would all like the smaller clinics would not be able to survive, especially in smaller cities who have very limited profit margins. And at the same time, the incre increase in bureaucratic processes. Uh, so the couple, uh, you know, going for surrogacy needs to uh, issue like need to, the, the national boards. Need, uh, they are supposed like they are supposed to go to the national boards and get one certificate of eligibility, certificate of essentiality. But given, you know, the current load case loads that the Indian, Indian jury the system has it can be questioned how you know Indian courts are if if the Indian courts are equipped to deal with all these additional legal burdens and uh, there's one uh, significant uh, you know uh, repercussion of the law that has been observed that there has been a significant increase in the price structures because of all the you know the uh, donors have to be registered buy a like a through a bank now ART bank now and there's a need to get an affidavit for the uh, insurance provision that has been given the donors the donors has to be insurance insured for 12 months the surrogates need to be insured for 36 months so the price has gone up 
And it uh, can be speculated that the accessibility and affordability of ART services might go down and the middle class not be like, you know, they might not be able to access the services anymore. And at the same time, because the uh, Indian law promotes a very altruistic model where the surrogates or the donor cannot be compensated now, there might be a shift in the availability of donors and surrogate because women might not want to, you know, uh, come and just uh, donate or, you know, or uh, give their services for free when they're not being compensated. And so lastly, I would just talk about what implication the laws do the law have on the reproductive labor. So basically, uh, as I've mentioned earlier, so the idea that women are being exploited and they are not really an autonomous agent, they are not able to make, you know, uh, independent choices on their own is a reductionist approach which needs to be which needs to be challenged and because we have seen from the field that the like the women who participate in the art and egg donation sector they are like it's very interesting to see that they are constantly challenging and negotiating their identities as mothers as workers and as participants of the art sector and the denial of reproductive labor by the state like forcing the women uh, to give away the reproductive labor for free needs to be challenged. And the critique, there's a on, like ongoing critique on the altruistic and surrogacy and egg donation model that has been propagated by the state. So basically the, like the proponents of this, uh, like the opponents of this law, uh, this altruistic model, they say that the law does not really, or like it's not well thought of, the law, law doesn't take into account the complication that altruistic surrogacy and egg donation might you know, have in the future because grow, given the uh, rising nuclearization of the families, the couple might not you know, able to find a surrogate or a, uh, egg donor from their own family. And even if they do, there's no telling what emotional repercussions they'll have within the family in future uh, so it that there's also one that is also one aspect that needs that needs to be looked at, and uh, the criteria of egg donation and surrogacy the like the donor is supposed to only donate once in her lifetime and the surrogate also is uh, can do act as a surrogate only once so that uh, and only seven oocytes can be retrieved the uh, ART law says uh, so all these uh, criteria makes you know the possibility of those requiring a donor gamut finding, uh, you know, chances to opt for donor uh, cycles very less. And lastly, it also ignores the post potential of uh, exploitation within the family, because even within the family, even if it's altruistic, a woman, a sister-in-law might be pressurized to act as surrogate by the mother-in-law for another, the, like the couple. So the law uh, does not look that it, it doesn't look at it. And lastly, the possibility of black marketization of the sector, there is a very, you know, uh, growing uh, possibility that this, uh, given all this restriction, and given this all the, the because there's the technology is available, the demand is not going to go away. And the pool of women who are not very aware of the law and what restriction the law still have, on ex donation and surrogacy, they might still be willing to engage in this sector. So there's a possibility that these the, the sector might go on like underground, and then it would increase the possibilities of more exploitation, further exploitation of this woman. And if that happens, the women won't have any legal protection or the safeguards to protect them from any exploitation that might happen. So uh, as as a concluding remark, I would like to say that. The law was really, you know, it, it was a need of an hour, it was a need of an hour to regulate, regu regulate this ART and surrogacy sector. And a lot of things that are right with the law, especially the insurance provisions, the uh, provision of counseling, you know, which was not mandatory, like, which was mandatory, but since they were not enforceable, clinics might or might not have been following them in past. So it was clearly needed. And the provision of a national registry, even if it's not functional yet, all the clinics need to submit all the data that they have regarding the donors and the clients, that the procedures they do. So these 
regulations are really welcome, but at the same time, uh, denying women to to you know the right to work or get compensated in exchange for the labor is a gross violation of the rights, and it would only le it has you know immense possibility of further exploitation that the state needs to you know uh, state needs to address. Uh, thank you.